Okay, so the, uh, the theme for the two classes is Christ in the two temples, which, if you remember, was actually the theme of the gathering this year. And uh, Brother Jed did his classes on Solomon and Ezekiel's temples. I was the backup for that, so I decided to do mine on the Christ in Herod's temple, his first ministry, and then Christ in the ecclesial house, the spiritual temple. So we're going to start today with... Christ in the days of Herod. And so we're going to reflect on just a few, I picked out a, just a few um, experiences that the Lord had in, in the temple during his first ministry so that we might consider some important principles of his ministry that were demonstrated through the experiences that he had as they are recorded in the Gospels. So the principles that we're going to try to cover today, I'll do is best I can, is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The second is, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And then the third one is, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So those are the three sections that we're going to look at. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read beginning at verse 41. So again, the, the overriding principle that we want to keep in our mind as we're looking at this uh, experience that the Lord has in the temple is seek ye first the kingdom of God and, <clears throat> we should never forget this part, and his righteousness. So Luke 2, beginning at verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now, age 12 was a uh, significant point in a young boy's life in Judea at that time. The Mishnah tells us about age 12. Now, of course, the Mishnah was uh, postdated after Christ's ministry. It was about 200 years after Christ's ministry. But the Mishnah is based on the Talmud, which was the oral law, which was in effect in the time of Christ. So... This idea is pertinent to the situation. So what is, what is it that the Mishnah tells us about at a, a boy at age 12? Well, age 12 is where the young man makes an oath to follow the law. At age 13, the oath take, takes effect and he is bar mitzvah. Does anybody know what bar mitzvah means? Son. Son of the commandment okay son of the commandment so he, at age 12 they commit themselves to follow the law age 13 they become a son of the commandment okay so that's the significance here that's why in scripture we're told that he at this time he was 12 years old at this particular um, Passover okay so at age 12 um, was the time for one to declare their intent and then the, the performance of that would be, again, um, came at age 13. And so what we see here in the record, I believe, the, the way that this is presented to us is that Christ is declaring his intentions very clearly. Okay? Mary says, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. The word sought there is in the imperfect tense, which means that it was a continuous or repeated action. 
We looked here, we looked here, we looked there. We've been looking continually for you. And th this demonstrates the anxiety that they were feeling about finding him. Essentially, they were saying, we, we were looking everywhere for you. The word sorrowing indicates agony or torment. So they spent those three days frantically searching for this young boy. They looked amongst their kinsfolk. They went down to the markets. They went over by the pools, in amongst the beggars, throughout the gates. They were looking everywhere. Where was he? And Jesus answers them. And I think that his answer spoke to their emotional state, that they were in torment. They were frantically searching for him. He says, wished ye not that I must be about my father's business. Now, wished ye not. Now, translate that into modern English. It's like, don't you know? Okay. But I don't think Jesus meant this in any kind of reprimand to his mother and Joseph. But rather, this was a reminder. It's not, when we say, don't you know, you could just as equally say, well, don't you remember? And of course, there were things which Mary had been told about her child. And the thing, those are the things that we read in verse 19. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So the things that she had been told concerning this boy was something that she pondered. And the idea there is she meditated upon these things. And so Jesus says, don't you know? Haven't you been told? Again, not as a reprimand, but as an answer to their, their, the, 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 the nature of their searching, their frantic, they, she, they, she said, sorrowing. We were in agony looking for you. Don't you remember? And the phrase about my father's business, well, this is a, a, a rather poor translation. Um, because it, seem, it would seem by that that he's saying, don't you know that I need to begin, begin my ministry? And of course, that wasn't the intent at all. He wasn't going to begin his ministry at age 12. So being about my father's business doesn't mean I'm, I'm done with the family life. I'm moving on to, to what my father has, the purpose he has for my, for my time here. It's not what he's talking about. The, um, the diaglot, the RSV, the not inspired version, they all render this as, wish ye not that I must be in my father's house in the courts of my father. So his, his words were not implying that he was moving out from underneath their care because verse 51 tells us that he returned home with them, that he submitted himself to their parentage, which God chose Joseph and Mary to guide his son in those early formative years. So certainly that parentage was excellent. So his, his intent was not moving away from them, but rather it, it's a matter of location. Don't you know that I would be in my father's house? So he's not saying, he's not saying I'm, I'm leaving you now. He's saying, you should have looked here. This is where I would be. From the things that you were told, you should remember that this, you come to this place, you would have found me. That's what he's saying. Why were you searching everywhere? Why were you down at the markets? Why were you at the pools? You should have come here. Because this is where you're going to find me. There's no other place. No other place in that city that interested him. That's where he wanted to be. And he was doing exactly what he wanted to be doing. And again, that what he was doing and where he was 
at that age is expressive of his declaring his intent to become the son of the commandment. That he, he would submit himself to his father's law. There was nothing else in that city. Everywhere else they, that they looked, there was nothing that would have interested the son of God. That was where he was going to be, and that is where they should have looked. If you think about Jerusalem at that time, and specifically, and when I say that time, I don't mean 2,000 years ago, I'm saying the Passover time. Okay, even in the temple, with all of its functions, other boys probably would have been engrossed by the altar offerings, you know, watching that, seeing, seeing all that that's going on. Some would have wondered about the, the rituals, how, you know, witnessing what these priests were doing in this very formal and ritualistic way and, and wondered about that. And of course, boys being boys is someone who would have been very, very interested in the killing and the bloodshed. Still others would have wondered at the magnificence of that place, of that temple, for it was a very magnificent place. And it was a stark contrast to what they were used to in their little villages. There was nothing like that where they lived. Sure, they had the synagogue, the place of learning, but they didn't have the temple with its edifice and with its pageantry and with its rituals and offerings and sacrifices. These things would have been engrossing to these young lads at that time. Absolutely, it was nothing like what they were used to. Jerusalem would have been a very amazing place. It would have been colorful and bustling with all kinds of people at the, at the uh, Passover time or any of the times of the feasts. M Jews came from all over the world. Acts chapter 2 is a witness to that, the day of Pentecost when Peter was preaching. Those Jews from the different nations heard the, the gospel in their own tongue. And they came from so many places around the world. And so it would have been, it would have been like a culture shock for anyone coming from any of the other small cities or, or towns such as Nazareth. It's been quite the thing to witness. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he was only interested in one thing and one thing only. And that would be the core purpose of the law. That's why he was there. He wasn't there to witness the sacrifices. He wasn't there to watch the pageantry wasn't there to mingle with the cultures. He was there to sit down with the doctors of the law and to, and to discuss the, the purpose of the law with all of its principles and its precepts. He wanted to know what their perception of or their perspective of that law was. And undoubtedly, he corrected them when they, when they were wrong. They marveled at his questions, not only his questions, but his answers. He knew his father's law and word far better than they did. This was the thing that interested him. His father's word was his first love. And the way it was expressed in the law fascinated him. And I think in these things he would have begun to, to realize in front of his eyes what his purpose was. What, why God had sent him he would have understood his place. Because the, the principle which the doctors and the lawyers would have been able to express to him through their, through their words, the principle was the true lesson of the offerings and the sacrifices. To go out and to, in the courtyard and to watch the thing, that's one thing. But if you really want to understand it, you need to understand the principles. And that's what he was doing. Why does the high priest wear these garments? What is, what is it with the precise nature of their duties? Everything that they had to do is very, very specific. And thinking about what lay beyond the veil, where the, only the mind's eye could go. These were the things that he wanted to know about. This was his concern. And so this record in Luke frames our first look into his character and his perspective. Involved in the things of his father's word and law, but not in a 
uh, what's the word I want? <laughs> it was, <laughs> I can't think of the word. Intellectually, he was engaged with it. Academic. Well, academically, he was engaged, but he wasn't, he wasn't there just to go, wow, look at, you know, look at this. This is neat. I've never seen that before. He was sitting down with the doctors to understand the principles behind these things. Because it was very, very important to him because this was his path. And at age 12, he, he's going to make his vow to follow that path. So that's where he was. That's what he was engaged in. And that's where they should have looked for him. So again, the principle here is that we seek first the kingdom of God. Christ declared his decision as early as possible. And his commitment was to be completely dedicated to fulfilling his father's purpose in his life. So much so that what he spent his time doing was learning about that purpose from the law. As we know, Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that the law was the schoolmaster or the pedagogue the servant of the household whose job it was to focus the child's attention on the lessons. That's the, the law is there. God is the teacher. The law is not the teacher. God is the teacher, but he used the law to focus the children of Israel on the principles of the atonement and everything that was involved in the law. Jesus had come to learn. To find the expression. And I believe to discuss with these men who should have been very wise in the law. There should have not been any equal to them anywhere else in the land. So that's where he went. He went to the best. He was better. But he went to them. To discuss these things. First. Foremost. And the lesson for us is well we need to declare our loyalties to the things of God, by the things that we talk about and the things that we do. Someone's looking for us. This is where we should be. This is where you will find me, here, in my Father's house. We need to have a, pro a proper focus and we need to have a willing spirit to the things of God. And that's marked by being enthusiastic about what you do about being prompt in our duties. We see this many places in scripture. When required by God to offer Isaac, Abraham rose early in the morning. Now you can imagine how incredible difficult that was a thing for him to do. And yet he didn't procrastinate, he didn't put it off. He rose early in the morning. And when Moses was bringing the, or God was bringing the Israelites into covenant relationship with him through Moses. Moses rose up early in the morning and he built an altar and he began the sacrifices whose blood was going to be used to consecrate the children of Israel. The scripture tells us he rose up early in the morning just like Abraham. And at the border of the land Joshua rose up early in the morning to bring the people over. First thing foremost this is what I'm going to do today. David wrote in Psalm 119, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. I thought on my ways, I considered myself, I turned my feet, okay, so I'm, I, I consider myself where I am and where I'm headed. Well, I'm gonna turn my feet and I'm going to run. I'm not going to delay. I'm going to keep thy testimonies first thing, foremost, straightway, devoted, focused, intent. And that's what I think we see here in Luke's record of the Lord in the temple. Now, is that the first time we see him in the temple? No. Because he was circumcised, wasn't he? He was presented. So, but this is the, the first voluntary interaction that we see significantly at age 12 
He is declaring his intent to become a son of the commandment, to do his father's will. And in order to do his father's will, he had to be there. And he had to begin that journey with an understanding of the principles, not just the, ooh, sacrifices, which I, I'm sure was the normal reaction for young boys at that, at that time. Those who were traveling into Jerusalem to see, to witness the Passover, to see the sacrifices, to see the temple in, in operation. Okay. I have no idea when I'm supposed to stop. I don't think I'm there yet. Okay. The second one, the second principle, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The reading is taken from John chapter 8. If you'd like to look that up. And I'm going to read verses 2 through 11. <clears throat> John chapter 8, beginning at verse 2. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. That gives us a point of reference. He's in the temple. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted, himself, lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto, him, unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, unto her Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now it's important for us to, to note that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, their intention was to use the law as an instrument of death. They were either going to kill this adulterous woman or they were going to kill Christ for blasphemy, or maybe both. That was their intent. They wanted to use the law as an instrument of death, as a means of destruction. Now, as for the woman, we know under the law, adultery was punished by death. The word accused that is used in verse 6 is a word that is primarily used in the judicial sense. As we see also in verse 10, where are thine accusers? Well, they wanted to accuse him, place him under judgment through this little ruse of theirs. And then after they leave, he says to the woman, where are thine accusers? Under the law, she would have been condemned. And in the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees, that condemnation was a foregone conclusion. She was guilty. And the law, Moses said, we must stone her. Now, if, if the Lord were to reject the law's condemnation of this woman, he would have been in danger himself, as Paul wrote in Hebrews 2, I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. The word that's translated despised there, he that despised the law, means to set aside. So what, what Paul is saying is you, you don't have the freedom we don't have the freedom to set aside the law of Christ. But under Moses, you couldn't just take the law aside and say, well, this is what I think. Okay? Those who did so died without mercy. So the elders rightly understood that no one could just set aside the law. And it's clear 
that they expected Jesus to not join them in their position against the woman. Now it's interesting that they set her in the midst, and that means in the middle. So they're here, he's there, they put her here in the middle. She was a dividing point between them. And they were, what they were doing is they were, they were physically demonstrating, we're the law, we're righteous, here's the test, what do you say? To divide them in the eyes of those who were sitting around watching. It was, to them it was a very simple and clear matter. And they thought, well, we finally got him. Would he stand with them on the law? Or would he set the law aside and be condemned by that law? Well, they thought that they understood very well the Lord's perception of the law because he healed on the Sabbath. That's against the law. He gleaned wheat on the Sabbath. He ate with unwashed hands. So they thought that they had a pretty good understanding of what he was going to say. Also, if you think about it, they knew who his associates were. They accused him of eating with publicans and sinners. People like this adulterous woman. They considered, they thought that these publicans and sinners and adulterous women were like his friends. And so they assumed that his sympathies would lie with the woman and not with them. That Jesus would take her aside and by that they, would, they, they had him, they had trapped him. That they intended to mark a, dis, a division between themselves and the Lord was quite clear in their words, they said, Moses in the law commanded, what sayest thou? They're using his own words against him there. They had not forgotten the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, ye have heard it said by them of old time, but I say unto you. But what they forgot was, I am not come to destroy the law, but to come come to fulfill the law. So when Jesus said the law said this, and I say this, he's not contradicting the law, he's bringing out the principle of the law. The law said do not commit adultery, he says do not look on a woman to lust after her. The law said do not kill, he says do not hate. So he was fulfilling the spirit, that part of the law which the, which the Jews had missed. They understood that thou shalt not kill and the not commit adultery. They understood that very well, but they didn't understand the principle. So he came to fulfill that. But in the eyes of these men, when he said that, to them he's saying, the law says this, but I say to you, forget the law, I say to you. And that wasn't his intent at all. But that's what, that's what they're presenting him with. They say, Moses said, what do you say? So if he sided with the woman, they considered or estimated that the law would condemn him to death. And if he joined with them against the woman, then he would have lost considerable influence with the followers because the, the people rejoiced in the way that he presented the commandments. They enjoyed his, his verbal and his moral uh, uh, sparring with the self-righteous scribes and elders. So if he sided with them, he would have been validating the perception that these men had of the law. And they knew that he would not validate them. And so they were confident in this little scheme of theirs that it would give them just cause to condemn him to death. And so rid them of the trouble that he was making. Well, his response was masterful and it was completely unexpected. They wanted his words to be his accuser, but he made their own consciences, their very thoughts, to be their own accusers. 
Five simple words. He that is without sin. And this cut them to the heart. It shut their mouths. It tied their hands. And their whole plan was overthrown. Five simple words. And so they turn away. And the Lord is left with this woman. And what does he do? He extends mercy to the woman. Neither do I condemn thee. Now, he wasn't going to ignore the law. Because he says, go and sin no more. I don't condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So somehow, even though the elders couldn't see it, mercy and law are blended together. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to do that. The Lord demonstrated that the intent of the law was not to find a way to condemn and kill. That was not the purpose of the law. It wasn't meant simply to frighten people into compliance because that produces a very shallow and a very negative aspect of obedience. We shouldn't obey out of fear. We should obey out of love. And if the law is is an expression of the Father, then as he is merciful, there must be mercy in that law. As he is kind, there must be kindness in that law. The law wasn't given to scare men and women into doing what was right. And it also wasn't given to condemn them all to death. Indeed, the law was designed to highlight what sin is. But it also exhibited the principles of the atonement. That God's mercy might be made manifest. And it encouraged people to obey God with the promise of blessing. And this is what was implied in the, in the interaction that the Lord had with this woman. Mercy, mercy is not the undoing of the law. It does not take away the law or its purpose. But it does take away condemnation. It allows an escape. Not an escape that should be taken advantage of by the sinner but an escape that is graciously offered by the mercy of a loving father. A father who desires to take away sin, not to execute sinners. God said through the prophet Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. The law wasn't given to execute the sinner. The law was given to turn the sinner from his ways. That turning from his ways, he might live. That's the intent behind, uh, uh, painting with a very broad brush, certainly. But that's the intent of the law. We, we do see a highlighting of sin in all the aspects of our life, but we also see God's mercy expressed in those offerings, those sacrifices, The Day of Atonement specifically. That is, God says, here's where you are, man. Here's how you can turn your life around. The the elders were focusing on this. The law is going to condemn either him or the woman. They totally missed the mercy, the grace. And that's what Jesus keyed on. I don't condemn thee. But I will uphold the law. Go and sin no more. Turn your life around. So the principle for us is to be merciful while keeping a proper perspective of God's command, commandments. The Lord's command to us. Be ye therefore merciful as your father is also merciful. Was God merciful In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and 
Eve sin? Yes, he was. Was God merciful in the law? Yes, he was. Again, God's intent is not to kill, execute sinners, but to remove sin. God is merciful, and therefore we should be merciful. The spirit of mercy is extended to those who trespass against us. And it is required of us that we be merciful. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we can't, or we should not bear grudges one against another. We should be forgiven. And we should also not use the law, or in our case, the word, the Bible, in a way to destroy a brother or a sister. The word says, what do you say? That's using the word against that brother. It was never the intent of God to cause strife and division through upholding his principles. We were put under his commandments that we might learn because we are the children. He is the father. He has assigned his word to teach us the lessons of the atonement. Why? To turn us from our sinful ways that we might walk in his ways and so do his righteousness. What time are we done, Josh? When, huh? Okay. All right, the third one then. <laughs> the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And of course, this is the, the words of the Lord uh, to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. Um, that's the principle. Now the reading is, is a short one, Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and as his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And this has bearing upon what he said to the woman at the well. The hour comes when, not at this mountain, not at Gerizim, not at Jerusalem, would you worship the Father. Now, it might be easy for us to question why the disciples, at, at this stage in their relationship with Jesus, would direct his attention to something that was so transient as the buildings of the temple. Why would they say, oh, isn't this wonderful? Look at the gold. Certainly, they would have understood that these were not things that interested him. But I guarantee you, they were interested in it. They were dazzled by that. It was a a truly magnificent and moving sight, the temple at that time. There's a Jewish proverb that said, he that has not seen the temple of Herod has never known what beauty is. It took them 80 years to construct that temple. 46 years to the time of Christ. So during the time of the Lord, they were still building, they were still working on this, on this uh, edifice. It wasn't finished until just short of a decade of the destruction in AD 70. So a little after AD 60, that's when the temple was finished. They were still working on it when the Lord was there. It wasn't done. But if you haven't seen Herod's temple, then you don't know what beauty is. Well, there would have been tens of thousands of workers working on that and thousands of priests themselves because only the priests could um, go into the, into the temple, into the building. So as they were building, they, what they did was they had priests building that part of the interior of the temple itself because no one else was allowed to go in. Eidesheim, who was a uh, Jewish historian of the 1800s, um, he wrote... 
The mind becomes bewildered at numbers, the accuracy of which we would hesitate to receive if they were not confirmed by modern investigations. We feel almost the same in speaking of the proportions of the holy house itself. It was built on immense foundations of solid blocks of white marble covered with gold, each block measuring, according to Josephus, 67 and a half by nine feet. That's a big piece of marble covered in gold. That's the foundation. The temple was likened by Josephus as a, as a snow-covered mountain. And the foundations, as Eidersheim wrote, this was that white marble covered with gold. And it's felt by many that when the temple burned, that gold ran in rivulets as it melted. And the, and the Romans would have been tearing that place apart stone by stone to get to that gold, thus fulfilling the Lord's words that not one stone will be left upon another. The whole complex was destroyed stone by stone. And obviously the Lord's words had a direct application to that, to that building, that building that was made by Herod, that corrupt king. But the implications of what he was talking about is much greater. And that's what we want to consider this morning. In his warning of the destruction that was to come, the Lord cited the prophet Daniel about the abomination of desolation being set up. We read that in Matthew 24, verse 15. When therefore, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, stand in the holy place, and we know the rest. Now significantly, the context of this reference to Daniel's prophecy includes the taking away of the Mosaic institution. Daniel 9 verse 27, where it speaks of the desolation of abomination. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. The desolation of abomination. Also in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from that time, the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. And the abomination that makes desolate set up. The abomination of desolation. Both times it talks about the taking away of the Mosaic institution. The sacrifices. The abomination, Christ said, was to stand in the holy place. And obviously he meant the temple. Now Josephus wrote in his book on Jewish wars, and now the Romans, upon the flight of the seditious into the city, so if, you, if you're familiar with the, the Roman conquering in AD 70, they came from the north, the northern part of the city, where the temple would have been situated. They came down through that through that wall and every on all those Jews who would have been resisting and fighting fled down into the city they essentially abandoned the temple when the Romans upon the flight of the seditious into the city upon the burning of the holy house itself and all the buildings round about brought their ensigns to the temple and set them over against the eastern gate and there they did offer sacrifices to them, and there did they make Titus Imperator with the greatest acclamations of joy. What is this? This is the destruction of the sacrifices. Don't get confused by synagogues. They didn't offer offerings in the synagogues that was a place of learning they offered in the temple now the temple has been destroyed that system is being taken away from the Jews and what's standing in its place is the ensigns of Rome and there they made sacrifices the abomination not just an abomination abomination of desolation what does the desolation speak of? Does it speak of simply the building falling down and, and all the things burned in the gold? No. That system of worship was desolated.
the significance of these events as the woman, uh, excuse me, as the Lord spoke to the woman at the well in John 4. The significance of the events is not about the destruction of the temple. It's about the inability of the people to worship Yahweh in the manner that they had received from Moses. Moses gave them the law, God gave them the law through Moses, established those rituals which were to be instructions. Of course, they perverted that. That was given to them through Moses and it, and it went forward. Even the Lord Jesus Christ was under that law, that same law. Well, now it was being taken away from them. They could not worship in Jerusalem anymore. The stones and the wood and the gold, those things meant nothing. Absolutely nothing. But take away the sacrifice. Take away the way that they worship. That was monumental. And it has not been restored to them since. Now, Jewish life was often centered around the temple. They had the festivals, the feasts. There were the altar offerings. Again, they were not free to, that if you bring an altar offering, you had to bring it to the priest. That was at the temple. Now, in the, in the days of the patriarchs, of course, it was the head of the household who would make those offerings. But under the Mosaic, it was the priesthood. That's what God established. They had to do it there at the temple. The festivals were there in Jerusalem, the temple. And it was presumed that the presence of Yahweh was in the most holy, even though that ark was absent, wasn't it? It wasn't there. Well, Christ came, and he was the antitypical ark, so that ark was there. The true meeting place between Yahweh and the people was there. And when this was rejected, this meeting place, this Ark of the Covenant, if you will, was rejected by Judea. The presence of God was taken away. And eventually the nation was taken away as well. But of course, it's not the end of the story. We really didn't have bearing on this. But we shouldn't leave it as God left them and they were destroyed and that's the end of the story. Of course not. God has a purpose with Israel. God has restored Israel in the land. He has given them Jerusalem again. And he, he will fulfill those things which he has spoken about Jerusalem, about his people in the land. Those things will be fulfilled. But at this time, when they rejected Christ, they rejected the Ark of the Covenant, there was no presence then. Not as there had been previously. So the, in the principle... The, uh, the Lord's words at the woman of the well, if we continued that quote about not worshiping in this mountain, which was Gerizim, or in Jerusalem, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Brother Roberts wrote about these words, the true worshipers, and the not being able to worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Brother Roberts wrote, Christ's words soared away from the question of locality. Not about Gerizim, not about Jerusalem. His words soared away from the question of locality, which was the vexed question between the Samaritan and the Jew. He obliterated it altogether, neither in this mountain, which was Gerizim, nor at Jerusalem. Now we should understand that the Samaritans had a parallel system of worship to the Jews. They had a priesthood, they had a temple, they had rituals, it was, and it was all patterned after the mosaic, but they had it in Mount Gerizim, and the Jews had it in, in Jerusalem. And her question is, well, which one's right? And Jesus says, neither. There's a time coming when neither will be right. Brother Roberts continues, not at Gerizim, not at Jerusalem, where then? Anywhere and everywhere. Wherever there were true worshipers, people knowing God as revealed to Moses and the prophets, and to whom in their conscious hearts God was a reality, and who in their sincere and loving spirits adored him, the Father seeks such to worship him, rather than the genuflecting formalist with whom the Samaritan woman would have been familiar, and with whom worship was a matter of performance 
rather than of the heart. God seeks men and women to worship him in spirit and in truth, not in location and ritual. Now we cannot, we cannot minimize the importance of the rituals that we have been given because they are a touchstone for us. But we cannot just say, well, we don't need rituals. But the rituals are not the key thing. It's the principle expressed in the ritual which you, which you are keeping in, in by doing that ritual. The memorial is one of those. That is a ritual that we do. The significance is not in the literal bread and the wine, but rather in what those things represent and the way that we take it into ourselves and make it a part of ourselves. That's why we eat bread and drink wine, is to make those principles of sacrifice and righteousness part of us. It's not enough just to do the ritual. And that's what Brother Roberts is talking about. This is taken away. So rituals that are performed without the true spirit are empty and vain. Matthew 15, verse 7 to 9. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me. In vain they were keeping the rituals. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. There was no truth in their ritual. There was no truth or no spirit in their actions. Because they lacked the principle. They had the formality. They lacked the principle. Empty, vain repetition of rituals, which became to the people a weariness. They have to do this again. And to Yahweh it became an abomination. And he said, don't even do it. And we need to be careful, brothers and sisters, as we perform our rituals, if you will. We need to keep the spirit and the truth of the principles within our hearts. That is the guiding factor for us. Why we do it. It cannot become an empty repetition. If it does, it will mean nothing to us, and it will mean nothing to God. And so God took away all the rituals out of that place, and he placed his name upon a spiritual temple built up of his sons and daughters, who through faith and righteousness are in the new way. Not in the old way of ritual and the letter of the law, which even though the letter of that law was to instill faith within the people, they missed that point. A new way was instituted and a purer form of worship was initiated through a new covenant and a new priesthood. A priesthood and a covenant that were founded on better promises than that of Moses. The covenant in Moses promised long life in the land if you kept the covenant. There's nothing of eternity there. The Abrahamic upon which the Christ's covenant and priesthood is based speaks of eternity. Through works? No. Through faith. With works being the expression of the faith. It's a new way that was instituted, faith and righteousness. So now in our day, in our age, how is the new and the better way being kept? And that's the subject of the next class, which was willing in two weeks, I guess. Uh, we'll look at the second Christ in the temple, but this will be the ecclesial house.